Praise God. It's time to begin our Bible study tonight. Sister Samson, could you please pray over the Bible study tonight, please? Amen. We're in the, still in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. We are still teaching about the new birth, the new birth. John, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. John, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. says, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answers, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Last week, we stopped at talking about Solomon. But we got to talking about Solomon because Nicodemus was thinking fleshly or carnally when he was saying in John, St. John chapter 3 and verse 4 about how can a man be born again? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and uh, be born. In the case of Solomon, he finally figured it out. After about 12 years of women, money, power, and philosophy, he said there in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and <clears throat> verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the matter, of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And from that time on, Solomon was uh, called the preacher. The preacher. I asked last week, I asked a question about what has been ruling your life or your soul. Has it been your flesh or has it been God's spirit? It's been shared that we should walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. If you're going to pursue the material and live for your flesh, you will never be satisfied. But if you live after and for the spirit, you will know life and peace eternally and presently. Jesus will give you peace now and in eternity. In St. John chapter 3 and verse 10, St. John chapter 3, in verse 10, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? There's a note of sadness in Jesus' response back to Nicodemus. How can Nicodemus be a teacher of Israel and, not, and yet not know uh, what's going on with these things? Nicodemus being a religious leader is like the blind leading the blind. What Jesus has shared with them is not sophisticated doctrine or teaching. These are the ABCs. And if Nicodemus can't even grasp uh, these truths taught through simple earthly symbols, there's no way he can understand and accept the deeper truths. It's only as we pass through the narrow door of the new birth that our eyes are open to apprehend deeper spiritual realities. The flesh or the carnal mind cannot understand spiritual truths. However, these beginning truths of the kingdom are not out of reach. They have been understood and accepted by others with far less theological training than Nicodemus. St. John chapter 3 in verse 11, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. The we in John chapter 3 in verse 11, it indicates that the testimony of Jesus has been authenticated or genuine. The identity of Jesus and his message has been grasped and entered into 
by others. I believe the gospel. Those that are out there that know Jesus Christ believe the gospel. We've grasped hold of the truths that's in the word of God. John the Baptist, who knew at Jesus' baptism, the first disciples um, who had come and seen and followed, John the Baptist knew that Jesus was real. He knew the message was real. And he followed. Among them is John, the writer here of this gospel. They had become witnesses. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will become a witness. Amen. Hello. I can preach right now. You'll become a witness of that which you have seen, which you have begun to grasp hold of. You'll know him in a relationship, as we say, a reality. He's real. No one can climb up and take these heavenly truths by force, either by learning or even by obedience to the law. It's only Jesus. Only Jesus can reveal the secrets of the kingdom of heaven to any willing seeker because he shares about his home. Jesus shares about where he came from. He said, I must do the works of my Father, which is in heaven. I must be about my Father's business. It's when we accept him, are born into his kingdom, that the realities in which he lives are shared with us. Heavenly things then are made clear. Our eyes, our spiritual eyes are illuminated. Otherwise, we stumble in fleshly darkness. In John chapter 3, verse 14 through 15, says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. To clarify his own identity and the meaning of his coming down from heaven, Jesus refers to a peculiar incident in the life of Moses. Near the end of the years of, of them wandering in the wilderness, and shortly before they entered in to the promised land, the children of Israel once again murmured in their unbelief. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among them that brought disease and death. Then the people repented and cried out, We've sinned. Again, Moses interceded for them just like he did so many other times. Did you know somebody prays for you? Hello? Amen. Somebody is praying for you. When you begin to do what the Lord has uh, shared upon your heart to do, it means that, hey, someone has prayed for you. You're here tonight because someone has prayed for you took out their time, made up their mind, and began to get on their knees and pray. And that prayer, it begins to ascend up past this roof, roof here tonight. It begins to go to heaven. And what does God do? He begins to dispatch uh, angels. And not only that, uh, he begins to speak to individuals' heart by his Holy Spirit. And those angels begin to dispatch why? The Spirit of God begins to deal with men and women hearts by his Holy Spirit. And those angels are dispatched to begin to get out of uh, uh, things out of your way that will stop you from coming to the house of God. Hello? That's how it works. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost deals with our heart and dispatches, heaven dispatches angels. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I want to do this. And those angels begin to come down, whoo, push things out the way and begins to get you to where the Lord wants you to be at. Moses interceded for them. The Lord then offered salvation through a strange provision. He commanded Moses to make a fiery serpent of bronze and to hang it on a pole. The people who had been bitten could be healed only by lifting up their eyes and looking at that bronze serpent. They would be saved by an act of faith. Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 through 9. 
It says, and they journeyed from Mount Hor, Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. You know anything about that, preachers? <laughs> Wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loath, loath this light bread. Numbers chapter 21, verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. They bit the people, and most people of Israel died. Why did, why, why did Because they were murmuring, complaining. But God's not going to see any fiery serpents. Don't say that. Numbers chapter 21, verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass. Put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So too, as John chapter 3 and verse 14 says, the Son of Man has come to be lifted up on a pole. This one who sits with Nicodemus here has made his descent from heaven in the flesh. One day he will die. His costly sacrifice calls forth the response of faith. Whosoever will behold with eyes of faith will be given everlasting life and will not suffer and die in the wilderness. This is God's provision for our salvation, to look upon the one who is high and lifted up. The Bible says in Hebrews, I believe, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus said in John, St. John chapter 12 and verse 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus said, if the cross is central, if you preach about the cross, if you lift me up, he would draw all men unto him. The message of the cross is Cross generational, I put down here. We don't have to be hip to reach uh, the young people or the conservatives. Or we don't have to be conservative to reach the older people. Because the cross is the magnet that draws all men to Jesus. Teach the cross. Share the cross. Walk in light of the cross. Revel in its riches and apply it to our lives. Share it with your friends regardless of how young or old they might be and watch it draw men and women to Jesus just like it drew you. Hello? Praise God. John chapter 6, excuse me, John chapter 3 verse 16 through 21. John chapter 3 verse 16 through 21. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, now that cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. We can see here from these verses that the lifting up of the Son of Man is an act of love. Love is central to the very nature of Almighty God. 
reaching out to all who are unlovely and sick. Like those dying Israelites with those serpents. Like Nicodemus here, as we've been sharing here. And like those who don't know him. People without Jesus are sick. They may not think, they may not feel like they're sick, but they're sick spiritually. And the only way they can be healed if Jesus comes into their hearts and their lives. That love that God begins to uh, uh, share with individuals is not selective or discriminating. It's universal. God comes to the whole world in love. It's the very nature of love to give the best and not hold back. Each one of us are here in our soul, in our lives, by coming to this 30-minute Bible study. We're giving God our best. The devil may say, well, you know, you don't have to do that. But the Lord is dealing with your heart to do that. Do it. The gift is unique here in verse 16. It says, the only begotten. The only begotten. The greater the object of love, the more costly the gift. Any old thing is not good enough. That, would be not, that wouldn't be love. We was teaching and preaching about good enough. Amen. What's good enough for God? Well, I come to church such and such time. That's good enough. What's good enough for the Lord? When God blesses us and, and blesses us with health and blesses us, good enough is just not good enough. Amen. The invitation is as wide as God's heart. Whosoever believeth, he will not cheapen the terms or he would not be true to himself. We can only accept the invitation by trust, by faith, and submitting ourselves to him. It has been that way with God since the beginning. This gift or new birth we're talking about here is everlasting. It lasts to eternity. A life consistent with the age to come. We may sit here tonight and think that this is the only thing uh, uh, that life has to offer, but there is another life after this life. We only live or well, promise 70, 75, 80 years, and we're not even promise that. In one day, the Bible says after this, the judgment. All of us are going to stand before God. We may, some have I've passed on in their 50s and their 40s and their 20s and their 30s. You know, we're still here. Every day I wake up, I, I think in my mind and I share with Sister Walls uh, a few times uh, through the week. God woke me up for another purpose. Woke me up to do something else for him. And when he doesn't wake me up, that's when he, if he calls me home, then my job and my work here is finished. But you know something? I'll be living, uh, <laughs> kicking off those shoes and brown, as Reverend Allen Wright would say, those, those, these white uh, toes begin to attack. That's Reverend Wright who said that. These toes would be uh, on the streets of gold. You know, it's not a dream, it's a reality. This life is not an endless duration of being in time, but being of which time is not a measure. This is life, I put down here, with God that is limitless. It's quality, not quantity. Don't think that you need more to enjoy life. It's not how much you have. But it's the quality of your life. Hello? Hey, brother, what time we got? Thank you. When you give a child a gift... I'm reminded when I, uh, when my kids were younger, I used to give them gifts at Christmas time or whatever. When you give them the gift, they play with the box more than they do with the gift. 
So why are you saying that, preacher? Because sometimes, you know, kids, they don't, you know, they really don't uh, understand. They just want to be entertained. You may buy an expensive gift for the child and, and uh, open up the box and give the child the, the, the gift out of the box, and all of a sudden you turn around, they're playing with that box more than they're playing with the gift. Our final destiny is life, not death. But the word perish here in John chapter 3 and verse 16 is here because those who do not look or believe are condemned. They refuse to accept God's gift. The judgment then is to remain in their present state. When a man or woman does not invite Christ into their heart and their life. Not only that, when people pray, people say, well, all I'm not to do is just pray, and I'm straight. You got to pray and apply. I always make the statement, uh, my, if my supervisor asked me to uh, sweep up something in the corner, he said, do you think you could do that? Yeah, I could do it. Okay, go ahead and do it. So he comes back and it's still in the corner. He said, I thought you said you could do it. Yeah, I said I could do it. But why didn't you do it? You may say you can do it, but if you're not doing it, you're not doing it. It's the same way in the Lord. You, you, people may say, well, I believe in the Lord. I believe in God. Well, come to church. If you believe in God, come on to the house of God. Apply the word of God to your life. You don't never see him. But I say I believe. But your belief doesn't go to your actions. I shared, if I told you uh, before this service, I'm going to give you $20. Guarantee you'd be right there. Pastor? Uh, yes. You, you said that I'm um, to come and talk to you. You're going to give me something, right? They don't accept the, the gift of God. They've already, the Bible says, they're already condemned. The judgment then is to remain in their present state. Here lies the two-edged meaning of Jesus coming. It's a two-edged sword. He came in love to save. He came in love to heal and to offer spiritual birth. He did not come to condemn or judge. But his coming sharpens the issue. Now we must decide. It's up to us. The ball is placed in our corner. That's why the Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not up to the pastor. It's not up to the church. It's not up to your mom or your daddy. But it's up to you. It's up to you to uh, uh, make the correct decision and the decisions that the Spirit of God dealing with you about because when it's all said and done you will be standing before the Lord yourself pastor's not going to be standing right next to you I may, may uh, maybe uh, Christ may call me back in to be a witness I don't know I don't know how it's going to work out but I believe that God you think technology is, is great down here I believe the Lord may have some technology you ain't even ever seen of remember that time you I don't remember God then all of a sudden you have this big 1,000 inch screen remember that service you was in right there I remember that service no excuse because the Lord will bring it back to remembrance we must decide there is both incredible opportunities or great danger in Nicodemus's uh, coming to Jesus Christ same with us it's great opportunity. God has given us great opportunity to come to him. There are so many benefits in coming. I mean, he said, I won't withhold any good thing to them that walk upright. So many benefits. He strengthens us. In our weakness, he said, we're made strong. He said, we're made of more than conquerors to him that loved us. Uh, just promise after promise. Our life will be prolonged. Just, uh, but if we don't come to him, the judgment of God. So, well, I don't, I, 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 preacher, don't t talk to me about all that stuff. I mean, sometimes people don't want to hear uh, the bad things or the judgments of, 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 you know, that God has for people that don't want to come to him or don't want to do correctly. They think it's just like a, uh, a candy shop. 
Just tell me the blessings. That's all I want to know, preacher. Tell me how God's going to bless me. Lord. Don't tell me how God's going to whoop me. You know, uh, when I was growing up, my dad, my dad was a strict person. You know, my mom, she was kind of strict, but if I did something wrong, my mom would say, well, your dad get him, I'm going to tell him. I didn't want to tell her that, but because my dad got home, boy, he take that belt out. Whoosh, you don't want to listen to your mama? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me you want to listen to her now. Too late. Well, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that when I didn't do right, something happened to me. And that was just my earthly dad. People want to say, oh, God is love. He's love. But you know something? God is a God of judgment also. We don't share about God's judgment enough, probably. I'm not trying to scare people in serving God because, there's, as I shared before, there's opportunities, incredible opportunities in serving the Lord. The Bible says he's willing for no man to perish but all to come to repentance. His love is extended out. His hands are always outreached, always Extended out to men and women. If you just have that uh, a picture in your mind from heaven that God's hands is always extended out uh, to a lost and dying world to reach, that men and women can just reach his hand, reach up his hand and just grasp hold of the hand of grace and mercy. Because God can keep us when we're weak. If Nicodemus chooses to lay aside all his preconceived ideas, in learning and accepts Jesus as the one who has come down from heaven he will be born again and men and women same way in our society if they would just lay aside all their preconceived ideas all of what we've learned from uh, of our parents our grandparents those that Meant, meant well and began to take the gospel verbatim and begin to invite him into our hearts and apply his words to our lives then we will be born again but if Nicodemus is, if Nicodemus, is, if Nicodemus chooses to turn aside to leave to work out his own salvation by his own efforts. However decent his efforts are, he stands under condemnation and will perish. And with that said, we can't do it in our own ability. We can't do what we think is right. Because the Bible says that every which way of a man is right in his own eyes. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but God pondered the hearts. And also it says, uh, every way is right in the eyes of man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. That's right. We have to do it God's way. With that, we're going to close in prayer. Brother Otto, we close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this Tuesday evening Bible study and the words that were spoken to our hearts. And we go our separate ways tonight, but the words that were directed towards us, Lord, to find that special lodging place in our heart, Lord. Bring us back to the appointed time and place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you is our prayer, and we'll see you back here Thursday evening at 630.